Oh Lord, we lift these songs to you. You are worthy of the praise of our lips. You are worthy that we would organize our thoughts and direct them to you together in melodies and harmonies to bring you glory, to acknowledge your greatness, to say you are worthy. And of course, you are worthy of far more than our songs. You are worthy, O Lord, that every thought that we have, every action we do, every motive that drives us would be pleasing to you. You are worthy that as we leave this building, our very lives would be as living sacrifices before you. You deserve every ounce of strength that we have. And we come to grips with the reality of how feeble is our faith, how weak is our praise, how languishing our love compared to what you are due. And we just pray, we believe, oh Lord, help our unbelief. Even now, oh God, we direct our hearts to you. We, we lay them bare before you. We do so willingly. You see every thought before we think it. You know our hearts. You know secret motives. You know the troubles that we face. Lord, you know us through and through better than we know ourselves. And we ask that our own hearts this morning would be laid, bar, laid bare before you, that your word would do its work to divide out thoughts and motives, to penetrate deep recesses, to bring to light what needs to be exposed. Oh God, would you be pleased to make us worshipers of you, to root out those things, vestiges and remnants of idolatries, things we love more than you, things we give attention to you out of sorts. We pray that all would be yours, for you are worthy of this and infinitely more. We ask for your help as we look at your word this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. As you find your seats, let me encourage you to find your Bibles and find your way to the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation. We're continuing our verse-by-verse -verse study of this book. There is no better way to enjoy holiday cheer than to dive into the doom and gloom of the book of Revelation. And this really highlights for us what expository preaching is. We just come to the next verses. Whatever they say, that's what we need to study. And in God's kindness, he gives us a, a severe and sobering history of the future. I don't know about you, but I am captivated by the accounts of natural disasters. I was glued to the pictures and videos in 2011 of that tsunami that killed 20,000 people set off by a 9.0 earthquake off the coast of Japan. It leveled towns, it obliterated coastlines, it demolished buildings and washed people out to sea. You may remember the 2004 earthquake, the 9.1 in the Indian Ocean that set off the December 26th tsunami. It ran through Indonesia and killed some 230,000 people. It's hard to grapple with numbers like that. Although that 2004 tsunami barely makes the top 10 of natural disasters in recorded history. Historic earthquakes around the world have killed many more. And two flooding events by the Yellow River in China have each killed nearly a million people at a time. Earthquakes and tsunamis, volcanic eruptions, hurricanes, tornadoes, mudslides that swallow whole villages. These are news stories or pages in history books. They happen in far off places to people that we don't know. We read the headlines, we watch the videos, we are gawkers and bystanders. We're removed from the suffering personally, but we are absorbed in the unfolding accounts of unexpected tragedy. But you know it's different when you're part of the story. 
It's like a car accident. Traffic will slow down to view the aftermath of a crash, but it's different when you're a participant in the car accident. In a moment, your life changes. The world may move on while you are left to pick up the broken pieces. The sixth seal judgment of Revelation chapter 6, the text we're looking at this morning, reveals a series of disasters in the natural world that will envelop the entire population of the earth. They're not news stories of some distant regional natural disaster. They are global calamities that will touch every human life on the planet. What we are about to read is a true historical account, a history of the future. Here's what God says will happen. Look at Revelation chapter 6, beginning in verse 12. I looked when he, the Lamb, Jesus, broke the sixth seal. And there was a great shaking, and the sun became black as sackcloth made of hair, and the whole moon became like blood, and the stars of the sky fell to the earth as a fig tree casts its unripe figs when shaken by a great wind. The sky was split apart like a scroll when it is rolled up, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. Then the kings of the earth and the great men and the commanders and the rich and the strong and every slave and free man hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains. And they said to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the presence of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come and who is able to stand? This is the judgment of God against rebellious humanity. It is the sixth in a series of future judgments. There are six judgments marked by the breaking of six seals on a scroll. The seventh seal unleashes a series of judgments announced by trumpets, and a seventh trumpet uncorks a series of judgments depicted by bowls being poured out from heaven on the earth. And these series of judgments get progressively worse, culminating in the return of Christ physically to the earth in Revelation chapter 19. These are literal events of future human history, and God warns us of their coming in this text of Scripture. What we're going to see this morning in this sixth seal judgment of God reveals two layers of disaster. We're going to look at those two layers of disaster one after the other. What has happened up to this point in the judgment of God and during this day of the Lord? Already there has been international war, civil war, famine, pestilence, rampant violence. Most of that has been man to man. The judgments of God up to this point in the book of Revelation has been God letting man go his way. You leave mankind alone without supernatural restraint, without the influence of people who love God. And what will humanity make of itself? An absolute demolition. And the first four seal judgments from God, those four horsemen, they were all vehicles for man-made catastrophes. This was God's judgment, but God's judgment was to unleash man against man. But what comes next is God's hand in direct retribution against rebellious mankind. God will unleash disasters in nature on a global scale to bring about this judgment. The first layer of disaster is the series of disasters in the natural world. We see this in verses 12 to 14. There are six of them. John, the author of the Revelation, says, I looked when he broke the sixth seal, and there was a great shaking, and the sun became black as sackcloth made of hair, and the whole moon became like blood. The stars of the sky fell to the earth as a fig tree casts its unripe figs when shaken by a great wind. The sky was split apart like a scroll when it is rolled up, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. This begins with the seeing of Jesus breaking the seal. This, of course, is the lion, the lamb from chapter 5. Jesus is the only one worthy to break these seals and to unleash these judgments. This takes place most likely in the first half of the seven-year period called the tribulation. 
In fact, when Jesus details the chronology of these events in Matthew 24, he would place this just ahead of the abomination of desolation. We'll get to that point. That is where a man called the Antichrist declares himself to be God, demands worship, and persecutes the earth. This happens before that time. And John records there was a great shaking. This is the Greek word seismos. We get seismology or seismic activity from this word. We use it often to describe earthquakes. It's the normal word for earthquake in the Bible. But clearly in this passage, it is of a more general shaking. And that is what the word means at its root, just a great shaking. This isn't the only earthquake that occurs in the end times of the book of Revelation. There are more earthquakes to come. In chapter 8, there will be an earthquake associated with the trumpet judgments that begins those trumpet judgments. In chapter 11, there will be 7,000 who are killed in Jerusalem during another earthquake when the two witnesses are resurrected. In chapter 11, verse 19, the seventh trumpet judgment sounds and an earthquake and thunder and a great hailstorm ensue. And then in chapter 16, turn over there for a moment, we read of yet another earthquake in these series of judgments. Look at Revelation 16, 18. There were flashes of lightning and sounds and peals of thunder, and there was a great earthquake, such as there had not been since man came to be upon the earth. So great an earthquake was it, and so mighty. The great city was split into three parts. The cities of the nations fell. Babylon the Great was remembered before God to give her the cup of the wine of his fierce wrath and every island fled away and the mountains were not found. And huge hailstones, about a hundred pounds each, came down from heaven upon men and men blasphemed God because of the plague of hail because its plague was extremely severe. So the earthquake we see in chapter 6 may be the worst one in human history up to that point but it will not be the worst one of all of these judgments. And that gives us some help in understanding the nature of these judgments. There is a cumulative effect of the judgments from heaven against the earth dwellers, and they get worse and worse. I don't know if you've lived through a violent earthquake. It's unsettling. Earthquakes I've been through have not been terribly severe some longer than others. And I'm kind of attracted to natural disasters. The first few seconds of an earthquake are kind of exciting. Your heart starts beating, the adrenaline gets going, and you're thinking, this is kind of fun. And seconds seem like hours as you begin to wonder, when will it stop? Some of you have been through very violent earthquakes. And in this judgment, in the sixth seal, the whole earth shakes, not just Southern California, not just Turkey or Papua New Guinea. This violent convulsion of the earth rattles everyone's cage. Imagine the phenomena in nature that go with it. Violent volcanism, clouds of ash filling the air, tsunamis affecting all of the coastlines. This would be a disruption to civilization worldwide. Every human on the earth would feel it. Every human would be affected. And think about the solid ground that you have relied on every day of your life to this point. Now the earth itself is unreliable. What happens when when the earth begins to sway and then dance and violently convulse? It is unsettling. Notice next, the sun became black as sackcloth made of hair. This is a simile. The sun doesn't become sackcloth made of hair. It it takes on the appearance, and, and this appearance is described from the perspective of earth dwellers. And the sackcloth was a a rough cloth made of goat's hair. It was used intentionally to be uncomfortable. It was clothing built for mourning. You were grieving and mourning some sad event, and so you'd wear this sackcloth, this black, hairy sackcloth. It it takes the appearance of the sun. 
And perhaps the result of the volcanic ash spewing into the atmosphere darkens the sun. Or maybe it's something less natural. You may remember in the plagues on Egypt for a period of three days, and in Egypt only, the land went dark, Exodus 10, 22. And you may remember that for three hours during the crucifixion of Christ, the land went dark, according to Luke 23. And perpetually in the Old Testament, the descriptions of the end of the world come with descriptions of darkness. Jesus described it this way in the Olivet Discourse. Now, sometimes we have our scientific explanations of the natural phenomena to give us comfort. In the pre-scientific age, when there was a solar eclipse or a lunar eclipse, those were seen as bad omens, portents of terrible days to come. And you could imagine why. The, the last partial solar eclipse we had here a couple of months ago, the sky only barely grew dim. In fact, if you didn't know to look for it, you might not have thought about it. We were at a baseball game, and it only slightly went dim. But it got cold, remarkably cold. And then there were places in North America where you had the total eclipse. In fact, a small travel industry revolves around the next solar eclipse in the continental United States. You can book your Airbnb now and hope there's no cloud cover to witness the next total solar eclipse. You can plan your trip. You can be to the right spot. We know when it will happen. We know the precise places you need to be to see it. It's predictable. It is like clockwork. Science has become the demythologizing agent to get us out of our superstitions. Oh, the sky went dark, something bad's going to happen. Uh, not necessarily. The moon just went in front of the sun for a few minutes. It's okay. We know when the next one's going to happen too. But not this darkness. This will be terrifying on a global scale. It will not be isolated to a region. It will not be predicted by the charts. This will be supernatural. And the cumulative effect of this will be stunning. After the four horsemen of the apocalypse, the, the first four seals, we had a, a world full of murder and violence, and then a massive worldwide earthquake, and now darkness. And then the text tells, tells us the whole moon became like blood. The moon takes on a, a red hue. Is this a result of the atmospheric debris, the smoke and ash in the sky, or maybe something supernatural? May 19th, 1780, was known as New England's Dark Day. And you can read about it. People had to light candles at midday in order to see. And the sun went black and the moon went red. What was the result? Well, scientists in our day have traced tree ring evidence back to a forest fire in Ontario, Canada that sent plumes of black smoke over greater New England. And for a whole day, it felt like nighttime. Eerie. Notice verse 13. The stars of the sky fell to the earth. This is an apparent falling of stars. That is, again, from the earth dweller's perspective, what does it look like? If the night sky is filled with points of light and those are the stars, and then these points of light start streaking towards the earth, what do we call them in our scientific day? Shooting stars, falling stars. Uh, these are not the giant stellar orbs that we normally think of stars. Uh, but the word star in the New Testament, in your Bible, refers to any heavenly body that is not the sun or the moon. And so to have this dramatic scene of, of many, many falling stars or shooting stars going through the sky, it's described here as a fig tree casting its unripe figs when shaken by a great wind. Fig trees at times would grow winter figs under their leaves. These figs would never get enough sun. They would never get enough warmth. They wouldn't grow to full size. They would be unripe and they'd be useless to the tree. And when a great wind would come through in the springtime, it would shake off those winter figs. They're tossed by the wind. And if you were a fig farmer, you would understand the simile. 
the sky all of a sudden looked like a fig tree shaken by a great wind and losing all of its worthless fruit. The stars seemed to be falling out of the sky. Perhaps meteors, meteorites. November 13, 1833 is known as the night the stars fell. It was, in fact, one of the greatest concentrations of meteors entering Earth's atmosphere ever witnessed by man. It's actually an installment of the great Leonid's meteor shower. It happens every 33.2 years. When the Earth's orbit travels through the tail or the orbit of Comet 55P, that's the Temple Tuttle Comet, and the, the comet's trail is not uniform. So sometimes when the Earth passes through its orbit, uh, it picks up more or less space debris. That's the debris that's blown off by solar radiation that makes the tail of the comet. Earth happens to pass through that tail and pick up this meteor shower. That is predictable. We know what it is. We know how it works. We can trace it back in history and that is exactly the phenomenon that was witnessed on November 13th, 1833, the night the stars fell. And the night was filled with a nonstop meteor shower. With all of our knowledge about these things now, consider the effect of this sixth seal judgment. Unpredicted. Not on the charts. You couldn't know that it was coming. It, it is surprising and terrifying. Again, the cumulative effect of these judgments on the psyche of humanity will bring humanity to a grinding halt. What will the scientists say? Will they be able to comfort a troubling world? They may come up with theories and ideas, but we'll find out the scientists are hiding in the caves like the rest of the world. In verse 14, the sky was split apart like a scroll when it is rolled up. You may be in the business of wrapping Christmas presents. You know, when you take out that roll of Christmas wrapping paper and you cut it down the middle, what does it do? It, it rolls up at both ends. It's kind of hard to keep it all in place to wrap the present you're trying to wrap. That is the way the sky above is depicted in this scene. From the perspective of earth dwellers, it will look as if the sky itself is coming apart, being torn at the middle, and its edges being rolled up to either side of the horizon. I don't know how to explain this. We know that the cosmos doesn't disappear yet. That doesn't happen until Revelation chapter 20. But the sky will appear to be split down the middle with the torn edges retreating either direction. Inexplicable, unexpected. The message from the sky is the whole thing is coming apart. The implication for this in our day, the day of NASA and SpaceX and privatized space exploration, talk of lunar colonies and Martian colonies, to look up at the sky and see the, the heavens falling apart and space falling apart means there will be no SpaceX version of Noah's Ark to catapult the elite of humanity to some extraterrestrial haven. It's not safe on the earth and there is nowhere else to go. There are more judgments to come that will affect the sun, moon, and the stars. In chapter 8, in the fourth trumpet judgment, a third of the heavenly lights will be darkened. In chapter 9, at the fifth trumpet, smoke will darken the sun and moon further. And in chapter 16, the fourth bowl judgment, the sun will be enlivened to scorch men on the earth. They will burn up from its searing heat. Notice the last part of verse 14. And every mountain and island were moved out of their places. Not removed. That takes place in chapter 16. We'll get there. But just moved. All of a sudden, the maps will be wrong. The GPS coordinates will be off. Imagine the devastation to human civilization when every piece of ground is shifted. 
Revelation 20 verse 11 describes the final dissolution of the earth when heavens and the earth themselves will flee from the presence of Christ in preparation for a new heavens and a new earth. This is a preview of that, just a little jolt, everything out of place. But this disaster, like all the disasters listed here in the sixth seal judgment, is not a distant news story but a catastrophe in which every human on the earth at that time will be a participant. The great shaking here is more than an earthquake. It is not just the ground that trembles, not just one fault line in one place, but the whole cosmos is in convulsions. Everything that humanity thought was stable and predictable and reliable will be falling apart. This is destabilizing, emotionally destructive, It will shake the self-confidence and melt the resilience of humanity. In fact, this series of disasters will be the worst the world has seen, even though there's worse still to come. But these disasters come from the natural environment, marshaled by God against rebellious humanity. They are external to man. But the second layer of disaster depicted in this text is internal. The second disaster is the disaster of the human heart. And we pick this up in verse 15. Notice what John writes. Then the kings of the earth and the great men and the commanders and the rich and the strong and every slave and free man hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains. They said to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face or the presence of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come, and who is able to stand? What's on display here is the human heart. What would mankind do when everything is destabilized and it is absolutely obvious that God is at the helm of these disasters? Repent, believe, turn in faith, cry for mercy. No, they make a suicide pact with Mother Earth. They would rather die than repent. This is what we're made of, naturally. That's the greatest natural disaster, the human heart, untouched by the grace of God. What is left of humanity on Earth at that time will have already survived world wars, anarchic violence, pestilences, the disruption of the supply chain, economic breakdown, famine, rampant vice, immorality, theft, and murder. A global, unprecedented selfishness where the closest ties of family and friends, those are supposed to be the warmest of relationships, break down out of a simple lust to survive. And then what's next? A series of worldwide devastating natural disasters. How does mankind respond? The kings of the earth, the great men, the commanders, all of them hide themselves in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains. The kings of the earth are the monarchs, the heads of state, the tyrants. The great men are probably the the kingmakers, the high-level government bureaucrats. The commanders, the word for commander here is the Kiliarch, the the thousand-man leader of the the Roman army, a high-ranking general. These are the battle-hardened military leaders. They've been through hard things before. They know how to get through hard things. And the rich, these are the oligarchs, the power brokers, the controllers of production and commerce. The strong are the physically strong or the influential in the world. And then the last category go together, every slave and free men. In the Roman world, this picks up the entire lower class of Roman civilization. Slaves and free men. When I was young, I I kind of balked at the mentions of slavery here in the book of Revelation because I knew my American history. In 1865, the Emancipation Proclamation, slavery's over. How can the Bible, a prophetic book, talk about slavery? I thought slavery was done. Didn't we fight the Civil War and it's over? I don't know if you've had the same hang-up. Maybe that was just me as a kid reading this book as an American with a narrow perspective. Did you know that today 167 countries practice slavery with over 46 million people enslaved? 
The whole swath of human civilization is described here. Every caste, every level is represented. Listen, have you ever been worried that the powerful people are getting away with it? That the truth behind government corruption and backroom deals and bribery schemes and shell companies will never see the light of day? Are you concerned that Jeffrey Epstein's client list will forever be buried? Have you ever let your heart slip into thinking that God must not be good or he must not care or he must not be there at all if evil is allowed to continue as it is? You have to understand, God has been patient with humanity. The day is coming. The day is coming where every class of man is leveled by God's judgment. They'll all be on the same plane. There will be no escape, no safe place. The kings and the slaves will be huddled together, cowering in fear under the judgments of Almighty God. And notice the text says they hid themselves. Does that sound familiar to you in your Bible? First book, last book. We've, we've talked about what, what happens in the book of Genesis. Everything gets unraveled, and the book of Revelation, everything gets re-raveled. This is one of those places. Do you remember what Adam and Eve did after they rebelled against God? Genesis chapter 3, opening scenes of your Bible. They hid themselves. Was that effective? The omniscient, omnipresent God knew exactly where they were, called them out. And even in God's presence, they put themselves behind fig leaves, trying to hide their rebellion, their shame. It doesn't work. This strategy here at the end of time will not work. They will try to hide from God. And they cannot escape the omniscient and omnipresent, almighty creator. The text tells us they hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains. You know, the sky has fallen. Chicken Little was right. And so where do you go? The, the bomb shelters. When I was in college, I rented a house with a couple of other guys and, and we had a bomb shelter in the house. It was built in the 1950s. Uh, Cuban Missile Crisis was a real thing. And that was right in line between Cuba and Washington, D.C. They figured they ought to build houses with bomb shelters. So that's where I lived for a year of my life in college, was in the bomb shelter in the bottom of this house. It stayed cool with no air conditioning. It was great. Would have been safe, uh, probably not if a nuclear device landed in East Tennessee. Not sure how effective those would be. Would it work hiding from the wrath of God in a bomb shelter in a house? What about the terror tunnels or the mine shafts or the limestone caves or the apocalypse bunkers that people build? NORAD has its base underneath the Rocky Mountains in case of nuclear holocaust. And the thought is, you know, maybe these holes in the ground can protect us from the meteorites. Have you ever been in a cave? Maybe you did that for recreation or sport. Maybe you went into the cave and you had everybody in your party turn out the lights at the same time. It's terrifying. Have you ever been in a cave in an earthquake? I can't imagine the terror. What do they cry out? There's no safe shelter. What are they left to say? Verse 16, they said to the mountains, fall on us. And hide us. Listen, the resilience of the human psyche is gone at this point. Keep calm and carry on went out the window. The, the tough dude with the tattoos on his knuckles that says, hold fast. His hands are trembling. Undaunted courage is now daunted. The imperturbable constitution of the strongest of men is now perturbed. And what are they saying? They're saying they would rather die than repent. They're calling on the, the mountains and the rocks to, to fall on them and, and hide them from God as if death could hide you from God. 
They're asking the rocks to bury them and kill them. And in a sense, they are praying together, but not to God. The terror here is, is from more than the natural disasters. They're actually asking a natural disaster to do them in. They're praying to the rocks. The terror here comes from the Lord of nature, not from some natural disaster. Instead of turning to God, they turn to Mother Earth and they ask for escape from the wrath of God. Notice in verse 16, the source of their troubles is clear. They cried out, fall on us and hide us. From what? From the face of Him or from the presence of Him who sits on the throne. They know this is God. These are the opening scenes of the judgment during the day of the Lord, and they know that God is behind it. They're acknowledging this. And instead of turning to God, they turn to the rocks. It's a strange, atheistic prayer circle. All their scientific explanations have gone out the window. They will not get comfort from the experts giving some alternative explanation. The experts are trembling in the caves too. This is a picture of madness, of unrepentance. This is guilt without the cross. I don't know if you've felt guilty in a context in your life where you did not experience the covering of the grace of God by the cross of Jesus Christ. And we do a lot of things to try to ameliorate the, give, the guilt. We distract ourselves, we compare ourselves to others. I'm not as bad as that guy. But this is that gnawing guilt of having offended the creator of the universe and you know it. And guilt without the cross of Christ is just madness. There's no forgiveness. There's no being distracted from the consequences of the rebellion. It is just desperation. I want out of this and I don't know where to turn except to ask for a rock slide and an avalanche to smother me. It's suicidal. That is where guilt without forgiveness goes. And he says, from the presence of him who sits on the throne, God sits on his throne and casts down these judgments. The, the rapid fire cataclysms force humanity to say, this has to be God. Hide us from his face. Listen, they believe. They even fear the Lord but they do not repent. Demons believe, demons tremble, and they don't get saved. Added to the presence of him who sits on the throne is from the wrath of the lamb, verse 16. That's a paradoxical phrase. Haven't seen a wrathful lamb. Lambs by nature are gentle. They, they just go along with what's happening. Of course, the lamb here is the one with horns. The lamb slain is also the lion of the tribe of Judah. One and the same person, the Lord Jesus Christ. Only one time in the Gospels do you have Jesus being described with this same word for wrath. Mark 3, 5, Jesus was in a room with religious hypocrites and a man with a withered hand an unusable hand, crippled. And on a Saturday, uh, a Sabbath, where the religious hypocrites had said it, it's illegal to help somebody on a Sabbath, Jesus commanded the man to stretch forth his withered hand. And, and nobody could argue against the miracle. It happened in front of them. A man who had no ability to stretch forth a withered hand received power from the command of Jesus, Jesus actually made his hand come forth. Undeniable miracle. And it provoked the religious hypocrites to try to figure out a way to kill Jesus. I don't know about you, if you were in the room, don't you think you would have said, I want to be on that guy's team? 
but their hearts were hardened, embittered against the one who could cause a withered hand to stretch forth, embittered against the one who could make the lame walk or the blind see or even raise the dead. They saw the miracles and they rejected the one who did it. Why? Because they didn't want God in their lives. They wanted to be gods of their own lives. What was true of the Pharisees in Jesus' day is true of the earth dwellers in the day of the Lord. They will not repent. Their hearts are hard. They believe, they fear, they will not turn. Verse 17 gives the summary. For the great day of their wrath has come, and who is able to stand? Again, this terror is not from the natural disasters at this point. The terror comes from the Lord of nature. In their suicide pact with Mother Earth, they give no consideration to what happens next. Out of the intolerable frying pan, they say, into the eternal fire of the unquenchable wrath of God's judgment after death. You need to understand, death is not a release for the unbeliever. It's not a release from punishment. It's not a relief of suffering in this life. And, and we must tremble when we contemplate it. The awful reality of the unquenchable wrath of God against those who will not repent is too terrifying to think of for long. It is the truth. And notice how this concludes a rhetorical question, who is able to stand? Recites an Old Testament prophet, Nahum. The answer is, well, no one. No, no one could, could survive this if it keeps on going. What innovation, what resourcefulness, what technology could get man out of this trouble now? Your savings account wouldn't help you, your workout regimen, your vitamins, your special diets, your gold bars, your ammunition, whatever it is you think would prolong life and preserve your way of life is worth nothing at this point. The comfort of hope and human ingenuity vanishes. Every man's a theologian now. <laughs> no more atheism. They know God is judging What's hard to take in this text is that you know the worst is yet to come. The judgments have just gotten started and how will humanity respond? Turn to chapter 9 and verse 6. In the fifth trumpet judgment, we read that men will seek death and will not find it. They will long to die, and death flees from them. Again, men would rather die than repent. And, and the difficulty of that trial is God will not allow them to die. Look at chapter 9, verse 20. The rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands so as not to worship demons and the idols of gold and silver and brass and stone and wood which can neither see nor hear nor walk. And they did not repent of their murders nor their sorceries nor their immoralities nor their thefts. Chapter 16 and verse 21. Huge hailstones, a hundred pounds each, came down from heaven upon men, and men blasphemed God. They'd rather curse God than repent. Chapter 18, verse 19. The population of the world threw dust on their heads and they were crying out, weeping and mourning, saying, Woe, woe, the great city in which all who had ships at sea become rich by her wealth, for in one hour she has been laid waste. Listen, the world's loyalties were to the economic system that was opposed to God, ruled by Satan, that brought them their stuff. And they lamented when the ships were sunk and the commerce ended. 
They didn't repent. They were just sad their stuff was up in smoke. Look at the next verse, verse 20. Rejoice over her, O heaven, and you saints and apostles and prophets, because God has pronounced judgment for you against her. That's a different perspective. Those twin perspectives are good for our heart to ask, where do my loyalties lie? Do I love this world so much that I'd be sad when it all falls apart? Or am I governed by the loyalties of heaven? Turn to chapter 19 and verse 19. Chapter 19 is the termination of all of these judgments and the return of Jesus Christ, the King of Kings, personally to the earth. And look what humanity does. Hey, there's Jesus. I, was, I, I, I begged him, if you're real, show yourself, prove it to me, and then I'll believe. Is that what they do? I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies assembled to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. When Jesus does show up personally, physically, visibly, undeniable, what will the world do? Take up swords. I hate you. I want to kill you again. The greatest natural disaster is the human heart. In this sixth seal judgment, the skies may have gone dark, but the human heart is darker. The very worst natural disaster is the human heart left in its natural state. Rather than repent, the hardened heart would prefer to die. And any who would turn to God would find mercy by simply confessing sin and turning from rebellion. And you would find grace and love and light and adoption and rescue out of this world system. God would forgive. And there are some we will see in this tribulation period who hear the gospel and believe the gospel. What do we know biblically about the human heart? God's assessment is what we ought to believe, not our own assessment. Genesis 6.5, every intention of the thought of, heart is, thought of the heart of man is only evil continually. You may say, well, I have good intentions. God says, no, the intentions are evil. Proverbs 3.5, the heart of man is not to be trusted. Jeremiah 17.9, the heart of man is more deceitful than all else. 2 Corinthians 2.14, the heart of man left in its natural state cannot even understand the things of God. They're spiritual things. And what do we do in our humanity? We, we whitewash our black hearts. There's a thin veneer of cheap paint over the reality of who we are on the inside. We comfort ourselves with that cheap paint. We lather it on. We paint it on each other. What does Jesus say? He says, from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, fornications, thefts, murders, adulteries, deeds of coveting and wickedness, as well as deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, and foolishness. All these evil things pro proceed from within and defile the man. No one escapes that indictment. None of us can say, my little sister made me do it, or the devil made me do it, or the peer pressure made me do it. Jesus said it comes from within we are the problem. The sobering reality is that humanity's best and worst will all be leveled by the judgment of Jesus and they would rather be crushed by rocks than to repent of their sins. Friends, what does this mean for us? I would just say beware the hardened heart. Take your heart out this morning, metaphorically. Watch it beat. What does your heart love? What does your heart go after? Unrepentance in a little thing ends up in this sixth seal judgment. You might think to yourself, oh, I would never do what these guys are doing. I mean, if the cataclysm started happening, I, I would think, oh yeah, I, I heard about that at church. I heard about that in Sunday school. 
My parents told me about that. Okay, this is it. Now I'm going to turn. I'm going to give up my sin. Sin doesn't work that way. Sin gets its claws in. It, it, it drives in deep. If, if you've had the unfortunate experience of, of walking next to one of those jumping cactuses in our desert, have you done that? I hope not. It, it, it seems like you get within an inch of it and, and the outer arm dislodges and the, the needles jump and drive in and, and microscopically they've got these little hooks that pull themselves deeper and deeper into the skin and the more you wrestle with it, the deeper it goes. Sin is like that. You can't think for a second that, hey, I can choose to sin today and I'll have a soft heart tomorrow. Sin gets in and works its way in and pulls its way in deeper. You become more and more ensnared and enslaved. You don't have the ability and the freedom to extricate yourself from that kind of mess. A stiff neck biblically ends up being a broken neck. If you have full knowledge, even here today, of some spiritual deficiency, and you are delaying shoring up things with God, there's no guarantee you'll have time and opportunity to fix it later. A hard heart actually works to mitigate against it to the point where you would say, I'd rather die than repent. It's the height of insanity. It is madness. It is the end of the road of unrepentance. My encouragement to you this morning is turn back now before it's too late. God may give you over to an irreparable hardness of heart. Second thing for us to consider this morning as Christians, we cannot shy away from the details depicted here. We have to come to Revelation 6. We can't cut and paste our Bibles. We, we can't go to the nice, sweet, happy passages and, and leave these ones in the dust, particularly when this is the end of human history. This is where the world is going. We can't shy away from it. This is the message the world most desperately needs. The, the, the crazy guy outside the football stadium with the sandwich board that says, the end is near. He's right. Listen, the main character of the, of the Bible is God Almighty. The main theme of the Bible is the glory of God as king, both in judgment and in salvation. And the message of the Bible is repent and believe the gospel. We cannot shy away from this. Additionally, as Christians, we cannot shy away from the desperate need of mankind around us. In the words of Keith Green, do you see? Do you care? Are you aware of all the people sinking down into judgment? Do you look around you at work? Are you aware of the people in your own home, under your roof, that need the love of God in Christ? Fourth, this morning, seeing the wrath of God depicted against humanity in this way helps us to get an understanding of what was happening at the cross. To understand the wrath of the one seated on the throne and the wrath of the Lamb there in Revelation is to actually see behind the scenes of what was going on on a cross on Calvary outside of Jerusalem nearly 2,000 years ago. To a watching world, to the soldiers standing by, to the people gathered around, to the gawkers and bypassers, they saw a guy running out of physical strength, thirsty, weak, puny, under the thumb of the Roman Empire, rejected by his own countrymen. Who is he? A sarcastic sign over the top, king of the Jews, some king. What the world could not see was what Jesus was actually doing there. 
In those hours on the cross, he absorbed the infinite wrath of Almighty God that was to be poured out against everyone who would ever believe, past, present, future, so that he could forgive every single sin, past, present, future, of everyone who would be his. Jesus there on the cross actually extinguished the wrath of God. The Lamb of God, who will judge the world at the end of time, was the Lamb of God who took away the sins of everyone who would put faith in Him. Stunning. Jesus, who will judge the world, is the only one who knows what it is like to be judged infinitely by God for sin. And Jesus speaks through His Word today to anyone. Come to Him. Have rest for your souls, forgiveness of sin, new life, be a new creation. Jesus can end your slavery of sin today. Guarantee you eternal life that can never be taken away and actually be your rock of safety from the judgments that will come to the earth. As we think about all of this as Christians, we ask ourselves, is, is our task to make the world a better place? Well, yes and no. The world's not going to be a better place. Where, where is it headed? It's headed to where the book of Revelation says it's going. It's going to a dramatic demolition and renovation under the hand of God. Christians, by their presence, love God, love others, do make the world a better place. We should. But our task is not a renovation of this temporary world, to make a nest and a permanent home here. Listen, a belief in biblical truth, a biblical truth about end times, is not escapism. It is actually to be more grounded in the desperate needs of this world than anybody else. The Christian task is to preach the gospel to everything that moves. Here in Tempe, in this valley, Arizona, ends of the earth, until he comes for us. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the gospel. You who know what it is to be judged for sin. Sins that you didn't commit, they were ours. You were the one who graciously warns us what judgment against sin for the unrepentant will be like. And it will not merely be a series of judgments at the end of earth's history, at the end of the day of man, but will actually culminate in an eternal judgment against sin for those who don't repent. God, our hearts are heavy, even for those in this room, in this moment, who don't yet know you. For a sea of kids on the other side of the hall who need to hear and believe the gospel, we pray, would you be pleased in your kindness and your mercy? You have not yet come in judgment against the earth. Would you save some? Would you bring them to yourself that they might know you and know your love and rescue from the wrath to come? It's in your name we pray.